This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. You have questions and the Virginia Department of Elections has answers. Go to vote.virginia.gov to register to vote, learn what to bring, what's on the ballot, and everything you need to know for the upcoming election. Find out why Virginia is for voters at vote.virginia.gov. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. There's an election coming up November the 6th, and we're delighted today to have the two heads of the Virginia Department of Elections here, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Chris Piper, the commissioner, Jessica Bowman, deputy commissioner, and there's a great deal to talk about in elections. We just saw a little clip encouraging people to, it's time for, for voting, and I've got quite a few questions I can ask, but really I want to get you all to start with some comments you'd like to make about the upcoming election, about the process, about what's happening. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I'll start with you. you. You worked in the Department of Elections prior to the time and then, then worked in a couple of other settings with the Tobacco Commission, the most recent, then coming back as Commissioner. And Jessica, you worked in government relations. Williams Mullins worked for a legislator. So you have a great deal of experience beyond what you're in right now. So what, what's going to happen between now and November 6th and, and what's going to happen that day? <laughs> Well, there's going to be a, a lot of work from the Department of Elections and our, our local registrars and their offices. Um, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of box to check um, on uh, in preparation for November 6th. Um, we're also seeing some uh, pretty high interest in this election. Um, so we anticipate the turnout to be uh, uh, larger than what is typical in a midterm. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, the... the the, the unique thing about elections is 40%, 60%, 100% people show up. All of that work still needs to be done in preparation. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just a matter of who, when they show up and how they show up on election day. But um, the, there's a lot of hardworking people out there preparing and making sure that uh, people can walk in, ask for their ballot, uh, uh, as long as they're eligible and properly registered. They can vote their ballot and, and be sure that their, their vote will count. Jessica? Sure. We are seeing um, an increase in uh, voter registration for this go around. We're also seeing an increase uh, applications for absentee ballots. Uh, the student number in early October has actually surpassed the total 2017 number. Uh, so we have seen a great uptick in that. Um, there's also, uh, just to let people know, two statewide referendums on the ballot oh, this yeah. year. Talk, talk some about those, because oftentimes people get to the polls without realizing that. Yeah, there are uh, two constitutional amendments, both dealing with uh, property tax exemptions, uh, one authorizing a locality uh, for real property dealing with recurrent flooding, um, and another uh, dealing with veteran spouses. So the best thing to do is research those. You can find them on our website and be ready uh, when you get in there. They're lengthy, as all amendments usually are, so it will save you some time. Uh, besides reading the uh, legal language, the explanation, and trying to make a decision right there on the spot. Okay. 
Okay, so that, that would be important for people to see because I guess otherwise some people just jump over and don't even vote on those. Right, right. It will save time at the polling place to research them ahead of time. Now, Jessica made one comment, and Chris, uh, the number kind of astounded me that, that on the student, uh, more, more this year than in the gubernatorial election, because us there's usually a big drop off. We were talking before we started the show that Virginia Public Access Project, VPAP, you can find them at vpap.org, has something on showing the, the number of people who voted in the last presidential, the last gubernatorial, the last U.S. Senate, then the House of Delegates, and there's usually a fairly significant drop-off in this election cycle that we're in this year. That's correct. Um, so in, just in 2014, which was the last midterm election for, for Congress, um, we're seeing almost twice the numbers of new registrations that we saw in 2014. And as Jessica mentioned, the student uh, total number of students uh, requesting an absentee ballot is surpasses what was requested last year as of early October. Um, and that's the total amount for uh, 2017. So we're, we're seeing a, a great amount of interest in this election and obviously a great amount of um, uh, uh, participation already, especially with the students um, and the younger, uh, the younger generation, which is, is encouraging to see, obviously. You know, I, I didn't look back that carefully to 2014, um, but I'm not sure that there were as many hotly contested U.S. House of Representative elections in Virginia that year. I'm not sure there were two open seats, or, and then like I say, three, three other seats in which the polls can tell you this one's ahead or that one's ahead, but they're all very, very competitive. And, and beyond, beyond that, what's, what's happening? Are people just taking voting more seriously or what's, what's maybe got people interested? Um, I think there um, are passionate issues on both sides this year. Um, obviously, the atmosphere we are in uh, gets people um, it's cited on both sides of the aisle, and so I think that is definitely um, shown in, in the amount of registrations and applications for absentee ballots. Now, that requires people to return their ballot, uh, so we can talk about applications all day, but if you don't return it, um, so that is still anecdotal evidence that we have, have right now, so it'll be interesting to see those ballots come back. Let me ask you a technical question because someone, viewer may be wondering about this. So if someone gets an absentee ballot, they apply for one, but then they decide they'll just go in and vote. Mm -hmm. is, does that create any problems locally when they're doing that? Uh, the, does the request create any kind of a problem to showing up and voting or, or how's that worked out? You know, you all hear no doubt even more than I do and others do around Capitol Square and around Virginia concern about election integrity and making sure that neither I nor anyone else would vote twice. Uh, but so if I, so I think I've laid the question out. I'm, I'm not sure what, what happened. The, the best thing to do is if a voter decides to do that is they should take uh, their absentee ballot to the polls with them. Um, to say, hey, great I didn't mail. Great, great advice. I didn't mail this in. I decided to come into my polling location and get an "I voted" sticker to wear around all day. <laughs> uh, so just, it will be a much easier process if you actually take the ballot that you received in the mail with you. Mm -hmm. So that that would help. Yes. So if I forgot and left it at home, I guess <laughs> that creates a challenge that has to be dealt with, dealt with locally. So in that case, um, when you show up to the poll, you can, you'll be marked as having requested an absentee ballot. And I, and I honestly want to make sure I'm saying this right, because she's, she's really good on the policy side of this. Um, Pressure. But if you, show, yeah, if you show up uh, and your ballot has not been cast, um, you're offered a provisional ballot that you can oh. cast. And then when they're checking uh, at the end of the night, to see if your ballot came in, they would either count the provisional ballot or it'd see that your absentee ballot did come in, and then uh, it would be rejected. We would reject that one. 
that would be correct. Um, <laughs> and I always have to check with her. <laughs> very good. No, and on the provisional ballot note, um, if you do show up to a polling location and f have forgotten your photo ID, which everyone should take a, fo a valid photo ID with them to the polls, um, you are always allowed to cast a provisional uh, ballot if your name for some reason is not on the poll book or any of those reasons um, you can always ask for a provisional ballot um, also if you get a normal ballot in your voting and you happen to mess up you fill in a wrong bubble your bubble is messy uh, please feel free to ask for a new one that is a much easier process uh, than sending one through a machine that may not be great um, when you can always ask for a new one you don't get in trouble, it's, it's okay. I, I remember that, uh, <laughs> the, the issue being, and we hope it never occurs again, of, of people trying to interpret what does that mark mean? Was that a marking out or is that just mm -hmm. confirming or what was it? And so, yes, uh, ask, ask for another ballot and turn Absolutely. that, turn that one in. Those do. Mistakes can happen while you're, you're standing there. Uh, yeah. I doubt if someone changes their mind while they're saying numbers, you can certainly <laughs> make, a, make a mistake in, in what, what you're doing. The, uh, uh, are computers used a great deal more now in elections than they were in the past? I mean, the kind of, um, and, and, I, and I guess where I'm, where I'm somewhat where I'm going with that, I know that uh, at the very recent JLARC study of elections, there was concern about um, making sure that nothing gets hacked and I think that I believe we were told that as far as we know that Virginia has I mean they haven't hacked in but um, you know all of us use computers and and does that and it helps in the work that we do but does that create challenges for both the department and maybe for the local registrars? Well, I think it's important to underline uh, prior to the 2000 presidential election and Bush versus Gore um, the, the elections process was largely paper-based. Um, we yes. remember lever machines and butterfly ballots and hanging chads, et cetera. Um, and, um, but since then, with an infusion of federal funds to the states, there has been a huge push toward uh, you know, making um, elections much more electronic. In fact, one of the requirements of the Help America Vote Act that came out of Congress after the uh, Bush-Gore presidential race was a requirement that a central registration database be uh, housed in every state. In Virginia, since the early 1970s, we've had a, a central voter registration database. In fact, we were one of the first in the nation to create one. Um, and, but not just the central voter registration database, but things like electronic poll books. And back in, uh, mm -hmm. back in olden times, mm -hmm. which is not much more than 10 years ago, right. uh, you remember the big, you know, the big oh, sheets yeah, of so paper that they would through, use to, yeah. Check, yeah, to flip through. Uh, and since then, just about every locality in Virginia uses an electronic poll book. So you'll see them uh, checking your name on a laptop. Um, and a lot of the concerns that we see is, is uh, related to those, those kinds of changes. Uh, with electronic poll books and the machines that we have in the uh, polling place, first of all, we have all uh, paper uh, balloting systems in, in Virginia, so the most of them are optical scans. Uh, that means it's a voter verified paper ballot. Um, and so nothing's electronic except for when, you, when it scans in. None of those machines, including the electronic poll books, are connected to the internet in any way. Um, so, and they that's, never. That's an important point. I'm going to pause you right there and get sure. you almost to say that. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> None of the machines in the polling place are ever connected to the internet. In yes. fact, the electronic polling books, uh, electronic poll books, are connected to each other through a wired system, but nothing is ever connected to the internet at any time. Um, and so it's important to understand that uh, the, the machines in the polling place are, are safe. Now you mentioned uh, what was pretty prevalent in 2016 uh, with some hacking. There were some states that did have their databases hacked into. I can say uh, very confidently that Virginia was one of the 21 states that was scanned. Um, meaning that the, web, the IP addresses that were flagged by the federal government were uh, scanning our website. But they were kind of looking for a way in, and they didn't find one. So they moved on to other states. Um, and so what we've done in, in Virginia is just upped our 
uh, security posture. I think that we've always been in a good, sh good shape. Um, and now we are in even better shape than we were previously. Excellent. You all have only been on the job and these jobs since February, since some point in February. What's, what's been your biggest surprise? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise every day? Yeah. No, I mean, I think um, this is actually my first time in the executive branch and in uh, state government not working for a legislator, which I think is uh, probably a little different. Um, and honestly, what has surprised me is the dedication with our workforce. Hmm. We have a great team that comes in every day. They get underpaid for what they do and they are dedicated to our mission as an agency. Mm -hmm. So the most pleasant surprise. Yes. I, I think for me, it's, it's um, a lot of what we were just talking about. I, I started at the Department of Elections in 2003. Um, uh, that's the, back in the old days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I had hair back then. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, back then, uh, we didn't really have an information technology division. Um, we worked closely with the Department of Information Technology, which is now VITA. Um, but we, uh, you know, it was a very small, very small agency. Since then, our information technology uh, division has grown to just about 18 employees. And we, uh, just about everything we do has to work through some sort of technology. So I think um, that part was pretty surprising. But I want to underline uh, what Jess said, the, um, the work this is, and like I said, I've been there since 2003 off and on, um, and while we've had a great uh, Department of Elections staff, this staff has, has just an incredible amount of dedication and passion for elections, and it shines through in everything they do, and it's, a, it's honestly a pleasure to work with them every single day. Excellent. Well, thank you. Tell, tell our viewers something about the, the structure beyond that. Uh, there's, there's a state board of elections, and People around Capitol Square understand what that means and how that happens, but um, some of our viewers may not. They, they may know about local electoral boards, but the state board of elections, what's, what's, what, what is it and how does it get named and, and what do they do? The State Board of Elections is a three-member body that are appointed by the uh, winner, the, uh, the governor, I'm sorry, the governor. Um, and two of the appointees are members of the governor's party, and one of the members is a member of the second place party, if you will. Um, they are what's considered in state government an advisory board. So this, the Department of Elections staff, which is headed by the agency head, the commissioner, and then the deputy commissioner, um, provide... Uh, policies, procedures, regulations, et cetera, that they then bring before the board for their approval. Um, and sometimes they can, the state board can provide uh, guidance on which way direction the board wants to go uh, for certain policies and procedures. Um, so they don't have direct oversight over the staff, but they do have an advisory role on everything um, that happens uh, with relation to, to elections. And the, and the timing of those appointments are, are interesting, uh, I think, for four-year terms, but they're not appointed until the governor's been in office for a year. Mm -hmm. Correct. So there's, there's, there's that, that a little different than some other board appointments. That's are. right. So the, the current board's term will end on January 31st, and the governor will have an opportunity to appoint uh, three new members or reappoint members whatever he so chooses. We'll be sending people to the website so they can find all kinds of information and they can even find information there. They can read about each of those board members if they want to. But beyond that, it's interesting, I think, on the homepage to see that three column list of, of all kinds of places that you can click. And I made, I made some notes on some of those. But before I would go to any of my notes, when you think of what's seen on that home page, um, do you know what's most accessed or do you know what people are most interested in as they come to that home page and they see, oh, I've got 15 or, or 18 or whatever the number is, options to click? Sure. Um, well, right now people um, are 
uh, checking their status to make sure ah. that they are registered yes. to vote, that that's there are good. no problems. So people are checking it. That's great. Um, so you can go check your status. It will tell you your polling place. It will also tell you your uh, general registrar information if you need to contact them for any reason or know where to go to uh, absentee in person vote. So that is probably uh, right now our heaviest heaviest traffic, uh, applying for an absentee ballot, uh, also um, a heavy traffic site, and then prior to uh, online registration closing, that um, of course is hugely popular to either register to vote or change your address where you may have, have moved. Yes. So it's important to note a couple of uh, uh, deadlines related to the website. Yes, um, good. So October 30, you can apply to uh, for an absentee ballot online through our website, vote.virginia.gov or elections.virginia.gov. Um, and you can apply up until October 30th for a vote, uh, I'm sorry, an absentee ballot application. Um, and then you can also uh, go to your local registration office and vote in person up until November 3rd for absentee uh, ballot. Those are situations where you are not able to get to the polls on election day for a variety of reasons, and those reasons are all listed on our website. Um, but if you are um, unable to be at the polls on election day, just a couple of notes. October 30th is the last day to apply for one to be mailed to you, uh, and November 3rd is the last day to uh, vote absentee in person. You know, one of those things you can click, there's military and overseas voters, and that comes up at, at times and we don't need to go over those deadlines or anything like that because uh, our viewers would uh, be overseas <laughs> and, and not wat watching this show. But I, I guess that's some helpful information there for, for people in those categories as well. Uh, uh, voter, voter photo ID, I guess that tells you, make sure you know which type ID uh, which type of ID is acceptable. Um, you can also ask for a free photo ID if you do not have one. Uh, DMV. From uh, uh, your local registrar office can provide yeah. one for voting mm -hmm. purposes. So for some reason you don't have a DMV ID, a student ID, an employer ID. Yeah. Um, we do offer those for free. Yeah. Uh, so you would be able to find that information there. Just don't wait to, uh, to November 6th to get it, right? <laughs> we could do that, actually. Uh, but yes, it is preferable. The <laughs> earlier, the better in everything yeah. elections. Should get. And, and there's the upcoming referendums. You can, you can get your information. Yes. You're talking about researching it. You just go to the, to the website, your elections website, and, and you've got that right there. There's something also on accessible voting. It would help people, I guess, if they are thinking, I want to go and vote, but I may not be able to get out of my car. That's correct. There's a lot of information about that. All of our polling places are required by federal law to be accessible. Uh, however, there are many voters who are unable to uh, get out of the car uh, or be able to stand in line for an extended period of time. So there's information on our website about how to request a curbside ballot. And we encourage you to look into that and uh, be prepared on election day. And candidate information. So if, if they have not been bombarded through the <laughs> air waves, their ears and their eyes and things dropped off at their house, they can get candidate information. And, and I suppose that would be very helpful to some in knowing who's actually going to be on their ballot. Because in, in urban areas, as I drive around, I, I see different signs of people, each party, and I said, that's, that's not in that district, but I guess signage can be there for people to drive by and see mm -hmm. that the candidates might put up, and so it could create a little bit of confusion that people wondering, will I really be voting for that congressional mm -hmm. candidate or not? So they can find out about their candidates by going on. There's also uh, local elections going on uh, in November, some special local elections, uh, some local referendums. So those are not what everyone's talking about, like the U.S. Senate or uh, the House of Representatives. So that's also a place you can go and you may find that you have a special election for a school board member uh, that will be on your ballot. So it's really important to research ahead of time um, and that way it makes the uh, polling place and your election day experience more expedient. 
Now, with this election coming up, this may be a question for after the election, but I'll toss it out now. In, in your tenure that you've had with the department, if you could wave your magic wand and change, what would you change? <laughs> um, there's a, well, I think that, I think what people don't realize about Virginia is that we have a, a lot of elections every year. We not only have our May and June primary, uh, wow. but we have a November yes. general. Um, but we also have, on average, uh, nine special elections per year. Um, so there's a lot that's going on, and there's never really a break. Um, so I would, uh, in, in my opinion, it would be it would be a wonderful thing to to just uh, see the uh, elections community uh, have have an opportunity to to work through these elections uh, and and. Um, and 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 slow down things a yeah. little bit. There has been yeah. the pace of change over the over the last twenty years has been pretty amazing when it comes to elections. So we'll leave it right there for now. And thank you both for being on this week in Richmond. Look forward to having you back sometime after the election. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.